Hey, thanks for joining us for PACT. I'm the P, Peter Coffin, the lovely Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor, Master of Science, candidate for the PhD. Wow. Oh, wow. We've updated him. Right here is the ACD. It's PACT that comes together to make PACT. You're the act. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast service. Also, make sure to leave us a glowing review on Audible and Apple Podcasts. Help us keep the lights on by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash pactpod. That's P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Your monthly support gets you into the Discord server, gets you exclusive content, and you see some content before everyone else. Finally, last thing we need to ask is for you to tell your friends who rely so, so big on word of mouth. We stream 6 p.m. Eastern every Saturday. Thanks a ton for tuning in. So what happens when a Buffett buys your town? Warren Buffett's son, Peter Buffett, has been working on a little project in Kingston, New York. So Sean Cooper is the author of this article um, describing what's kind of happened in Kingston since 1995 when IBM, which was basically the economic staple of Kingston, left in that year and the economic downfall of the town that followed over the past 25 years and how capital interests have been pushed in a, at least an ostensibly benevolent manner to try to restructure this town into this great happening, thriving place. An artist paradise, diversity all, all across the board. Lots of murals. (laughs) I was just going to say that too. (laughs) Uh, So how, how do you rebuild? Um, when IBM, this gigantic corporation of technology that's pretty much like a foundational staple of the globe at this point. In 1995, what do you do when that happens? Well, um, you call Peter Buffett. Or Peter Buffett decides to descend upon your town like a <laughs> hurricane, which he actually says. Yeah, oh, as, as we explore the specifics of this article, we're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, Peter is an interesting guy. Yeah, he he could not be a human being if he tried. He, and he does. He tries he, he very does. hard. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to go through Cooper's article content-wise. We're going to look at what the implications of Buffett's influence has been. And then kind of explore those ideas of benevolent billionaire dictatorship. So, Kingston, New York. It's a small town in, in New York State with 23,000 people in it. Um, back in the 1950s, IBM, it was essentially a company town. If you've ever heard of what that is, it's typical in manufacturing sectors. It's like a college town, but instead of a college that the town revolves around, it's a a big business or a plant or a factory or whatever. Well, like a lumber mill or a, when I was young, Waterville had a paper mill. Like there was a, a, you a paper. You literally a thousand. That's a paper, insane. That, it was a company town. Like most of the people in that town worked there or at the farm. All the cars were always covered in soot. It was terrible. IBM employed over 7,000 people. It was a very large chunk of all of the people that lived in this town. And they pulled out about 25 years ago. Here's the thing about that. When you're a one company town, when IBM runs the show and they disappear... You go for a couple of decades with nothing where, I mean, this town was filled with tenants that don't make enough money, huge crime problem because it's a huge poverty problem. It's like when uh, you're an island and you're annexed by the United States and 90% of your economy is one resource. And you have to do a humanist revolution. Yeah. (laughs) You got to do a humanist revolution that is in no way affiliated with Karl Marx or Vladimir Lenin. Yeah, we're we're, uh, Castro humanists here. Yeah, that's our thing. Um, (laughs) but when that happens and somebody who has a lot of money starts making big investments in your town, you start going, wait, is this good? This kind of seems like springtime is here. Finally, we've been waiting for so long. A long winter. Yeah, it's been a long winter here in Kingston, New York. It's been for so long by IBM leaving. Yeah. The warm embrace of IBM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haven't felt it in a long time. <laughs> I've felt it a long time. 
So anyways, um, a lot of people actually do like very much think like the redevelopment is so great. I mean, this is somebody who's uh, 30 years old, who Sean Cooper interviewed. Uh, it's a person who... They have one of those kind of like bullshit jobs. Yeah. <laughs> <For Adam They're, laughs> They're the deputy director of the Economic Development Department uh, and spokesperson for Ulster County's major real estate product project, which, which is real jobs, is a real job. Yes, a very, very real job where you're doing something important, very critical. But that's, about- I, I mean, that's not an indictment of this person. Like this is no. this is what has happened in their town, and I this mean, this person is being interviewed by Cooper about. How does the town recover from this in 1995? How did this affect you when you were in middle school? Your friends move away. Your friends' parents lose their jobs. Your parents might have lost their jobs. Um, And there's ambivalence among these people when they're interviewed because they're like, well, I I mean, like, I don't really have a lot of say in what's going on. These things just kind of happen right before my eyes so fast. I, I, I don't even recognize my own town. But we don't want to deny funding of our town so so maybe this is good maybe it's this person says changing the narrative of our town and yeah. healing the space of our town and so this like kind of liberal ideology with buffett's oversight is kind of being ingratiated into a population of very uncertain people i'll give the direct quotes <laughs> it's going to change the narrative you know and change how people feel about this place the redevelopment. The redevelopment project, which they call this a once in a generation <laughs> opportunity in their vision plan. You love it when your your city's economic development that was contingent on a massive technological corporation that pulled out of your town starts developing a vision board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to reinvigorate your town. We're gonna manifest a good economy in this yeah, town. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're vibrating at a productive economy frequency. We are. (laughs) So there's a consortium known as Blueprint, which is promising as many as 300 new jobs. It's an applicant for uh, the abandoned IBM building to take it over and renovate it and turn it into their their space to hold. And heal. We're talking about space. Uh, They're considered basically the only candidate, even though there are a bunch of other applicants, because they are the only applicant that is funded by Peter Buffett's Novo Foundation. Couple of quick facts about Novo. It's a nonprofit entity founded by Peter Buffett and his wife, Mrs. Buffett. I don't remember her name. Oh, Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer. Jennifer. His second wife, Jennifer. I like calling her Mrs. Buffett better. That's funnier by a lot. Hello, I'm Mrs. Buffett. <laughs> Would you like some tea? Novo Foundation is one of the richest philanthropic organizations in the entire world. They have access to billions of dollars via Warren Buffett, Peter Buffett's dad, who endows the foundation with large amounts of Berkshire Hathaway stock. It's run by Peter and uh, Mrs. Buffett. (laughs) I can't. Jennifer. Yeah, this is a new character you're never going to get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> around the house. Would you like some tea? Long story short, Novo owns, runs, or financially manipulates various organizations in Kingston, New York. Now, when I say financially manipulates, I mean they give money to, and they don't necessarily own, but because of the money they give to, they more or less run. The people who run these things have to be careful what they're doing and saying. Novo is also behind a local printed currency, which is like literally an artistic currency. A 1,500-acre farm and produce distribution center, a food co-op, a museum, a mutual aid network, a healthcare network, a hospital, the Kingston Land Bank, the YMCA, the community center, and dozens of nonprofits that are working on all imaginable forms of community projects. Uh, Novo is also the predominant and exclusive funder of Kingston's local news media. Radio Kingston was purchased by Novo. Purchased, not funded, purchased. Novo owns Radio Kingston, which is like the primary disseminator of information in the community. Uh, They purchased it in 2017 for $500,000. They installed 
Kelly Merriman, which is Novo's chief op chief operations officer, a little Freudian slip there, chief <laughs> chief operating officer to oversee the station's fiscal operations. Um, since then, they have pumped first one point seven million dollars into it, which is more than three times the amount they paid for it. Then thirteen million, and then twelve million, totaling a twenty six point seven million dollars that they have put into the radio operation which is like the primary like i said a form of communication to the community the primary local media so to continue painting the picture in kingston i'm just going to read this paragraph verbatim intense poverty still persists in kingston alongside the effects of gentrification you have two things at play in that neighborhood a former employee of a novo funded entity and local resident explained to me one being a community dealing with an incredibly impoverished generational poverty, which interestingly for that area, Kingston is both black and white with a lot of interracial families. The second is there's a very significant undocumented community, mostly Salvadorian and Honduran. The other layer to this is that you have a lot of gun violence and in the pocket where Novo is building and investing, you see an area that's been more heavily policed than any other part of Kingston. So I'd say you have the hallmarks for successful gentrification and possibly hyper gentrification. This is all without for profit yeah. entities guiding the gentrification. And I'll tell you an, an, uh, an analogy to this in where I'm from, Michigan. Uh, it's Benton Harbor. There's a company called Whirlpool, which makes your dishwasher, your washing machine, probably a bunch of other shit, maybe your refrigerator. If it's Maytag, it's also them. They own Kenmore. They own a lot of brands at this point. So in Benton Harbor, there is an entity called Cornerstone Alliance. It is a nonprofit that is funded by the Whirlpool Corporation. And it is the director of economic planning, of city planning, etc. What does that effectively mean? Whirlpool Corporation essentially plans and develops Benton Harbor, Michigan. Same thing's going on here. What's happening here in that situation and what's happening with Peter Buffett and Kingston is basically a microcosm of what is talked about in People's Republic of Walmart. Mm. And that people in the United States are thinking of like pro-markets, pro-capitalism, uh, societies in which neoliberal ideology is the fundamental aspect of the superstructure originating from capitalism people hear planned economy and they're like oh my god planned economy like we're not communists like china no we the want soviet union but but what's actually happening is that finance capital and large corporations across the globe through imperialism are planning our economy already this example is an example of an individual connected to finance capital who is doing this. We're gonna go ahead and talk about Peter Buffett a little bit. Peter Buffett thinks that he grew up poor. <laughs> 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 Not really, but like he was supposedly totally blissfully ignorant of the fact that Warren Buffett was a billionaire. They lived in a modest house and- Well, they didn't. He had a, a, a vacation house in Laguna Beach in Southern California, but like had no idea that he was as rich as he was. Because like, you know, his living conditions in both his family home and his vacation home in Laguna Beach, Southern California. You, to be fair, you can't have those things and not be Buffett rich. Yeah, but I'm saying he wasn't poor. Yeah, no. His, no, no, no. He wasn't going around wearing the Oliver Twist hat asking for <laughs> some more porridge. Yeah. Like you were. He wasn't cleaning soot <laughs> off of his Renault Alliance. <laughs> My work in Kingston, Peter said on a 2019 panel, was informed more than anything else from one event, and that was after Hurricane Irene. While out surveying the damage around his new estate, he was struck by what the intense flooding had done to all the tall, mature trees. These seemingly intractable things, they just fell right over, according to Buffett. Alluding to the money that Nova would soon invest in Kingston, Peter seemed to be saying that the local city and county government were the big trees and that Nova was the hurricane. I started to see these ingredients as the ground, literally and figuratively, and thought we can soak this, not indiscriminately, 
and start to see where we can soak the ground and see what can fall over. If he realized that it was a bit unsettling to liken Novo money to a hurricane that killed more than 50 <laughs> people and led to $14 billion in damages, he didn't let on. We're trying to practice 21st century alchemy, he added. We're trying to turn money into love. So he describes his, and again, like well-intentioned investment into this community as a hurricane that destroys its existing pillars. Yeah, he also says something just absolutely bizarre. On a video program called The Laura Flanders Show, itself the recipient of $250,000 of funding from Novo in 2017, Peter described Radio Kingston. Remember the radio station I said that they bought entirely and then sunk $26.7 million into? He described Radio Kingston as not just a radio station, but something else. It's about these other ways it can put its tentacles into the community, which is like, <laughs> have you ever seen that political cartoon with like railing against imperialism as like an octopus putting its tentacles all over the planet? You know, and always sunny when all of them go on family fight, like the family feud spoof. And Dennis is trying so hard to come off as like a normal, like middle of the road uh, American person. And like, he just cannot get it. Like he, he cannot communicate that by, by any means. Like he sounds like such a fucking villain all the time. Yeah. Okay, so Peter Buffett and the Novo Foundation have a financial hand in pretty much every single important project happening in Kingston, whether it's developing an independent currency of their own, whether it's the, the small businesses that are there, the art, the overall culture of the community, um, new agricultural systems. Like they, they have a hand in every single thing that's critical that's happening in Kingston. And a, a, a longtime Novo collaborator and Kingston resident characterized it this way. I think of it as a tidal wave. The Novo money just washes over everything here and nothing can withstand it. Just to find someone who's not connected with it or supported by the foundation in some way right now is very challenging. Like somebody else in this article talks about how when they're going to meetings with people who ostensibly don't have anything to do with Novo in any way, they find out they're basically at a Novo meeting because everybody is funded by Novo. So there is no comprehensive public documentation on how much Novo has spent in the region. Novo does not publish an annual report and its statements offer little insight. There's obviously no democratic process into this. This is a, a benevolent dictator yeah. enacting you know, his own idea of utopia. It's he who feeds you, controls you. This article is more or less about refutilizing uh, a capitalist society. We're, we're seeing Peter Buffett become a lord. That's, that's the process that is happening in Kingston. And Kingston is like the model city, an experiment to prove that this can the be done. The communist anti-capitalist city on a hill that's yeah. funded by a billionaire. Yeah, exactly. A well-intentioned billionaire. Again, this has nothing to do with intention. Yeah, well, he thinks he's saving the world. Climate change is coming. Everything is going to be scary. We need to degrow the economy. We need to create this localist economy where somehow... We all need to live on $2. Yeah, we all need to live on $2. You really need to watch Fox's videos. Um, a, will the revolution be funded? And B, consumerism, can we buy a better world? This Fantastic. Go to the Space Commune YouTube channel for those and watch them. Take them in. Seriously, take that information very seriously. Good friends. Put who it are, in your butt. They're actually from Kingston, yeah, uh, Fox right. and Alex. There are a lot of people that are gathering a slightly less precise message from this. They're not taking in the, mm -hmm. the fact that it, this is about the refutilization of a capitalist society. People are taking it more as democracy good, authoritarianism bad. Mm -hmm. And that's not specifically what's going on here because... Well, democracy, yes, is good. It is good that you have some input as to how society is run. That is a good thing. I'm not going to go against that. Um, democracy is ultimately a state arrangement. It is, I mean, not actually possible unless you have a proletarian state. Uh, we don't. 
<laughs> so we don't live in a democracy. To take the message, democracy good, authoritarianism bad, kind of allows a misconception that because the U.S. state is somehow in contrast to what is happening in Kingston, New York, that it is a preferable and democratic situation. Kingston is an authoritarian situation where there's like sea lab levels of secrecy. You need to be a level five Novo head to know the truth or whatever. No, the U.S. state isn't actually more democratic. The U.S. state isn't democratic. We call ourselves a democracy. We conquer the world with our democracy. Yeah, we do. We're supposed to. God wanted us to. Yeah, God did want us to do that. I, I heard that. Here's the thing. A genuine democracy isn't possible without a proletarian state, which we don't have. We have a bourgeois slash capitalist state. And, and all states exist to enforce a single class's rule over another. In a proletarian state, that would be the enforcement of the working class's rule over the bourgeoisie as the bourgeoisie is gradually proletarianized. And, and just a, as a caveat, I, I know we're using the word authoritarianism and I don't want to make authoritarian into a boogeyman word and everybody is going to call me a tanky and whatever for that. Um, but this is not a bad thing. A revolution is the most authoritarian action that could possibly take place because you're imposing the rule of the proletarian state on the ruling class. And you want that. You want that. That's good. You want the people to rule. Yeah. It's that simple. You want the people to have the authority. That's what democracy technically is. And that's why democracy is a state arrangement. Yes. A proletarian state would need to preserve its rule over the bourgeoisie in order to disempower them. Yeah. What class is actually about is ownership of the means of production. Uh, and when the bourgeoisie is fully proletarianized, that ends class because there is no longer a class of people defined by owning the means of production privately amongst a small group of people. The, the, the means of production would be uh, disseminated in ownership. People would own the means to produce. The Buffets are ruling class in capitalism and in the neo-feudal utopia that Peter Buffett is building in Kingston because ownership is where the power comes from. Capitalism is as authoritarian as Kingston is. It's the same power, it's just more diffuse in capitalism. It's a different arrangement, but it's the same people ruling. We're asking you not to look at this from a dichotomy of democracy, good, authoritarianism, bad. We're that's why political compasses are fucked up. Yeah, that's why, <laughs> exactly. We're asking you to look at this from the case of who has the power. Is it the people or is it the capital holders? This simplifies so much. <laughs> it allows you to see the relations of how power flows in society so much easier. because, And it also allows you to understand why they would want to move to a neo-feudal arrangement in which you're renting everything or you're subscribed to everything. And you, you don't have things that you can build equity with you Which don't have we are completely doing oh absolutely right uh do you own dvds anymore no you have a subscription to netflix do you buy video games anymore no you own a subscription to xbox game pass do you own your living space no is that a permanent thing for you absolutely not if you ran out of money tomorrow that's it you're done ultimately what's happening right now is just enclosure Enclosure was a process that happened in England in like the 1100 era where there was a commons where people had access. They could all farm the land. It was publicly available. Nobody technically owned it. And then enclosure was essentially the conquering of that land, the privatization of that land. Suddenly, like you were running farms as businesses, etc. For a, a more recent example, you could call like the town square, the concept of a town square, a commons. And like social media is the enclosure of that commons. Sure. For the most simple version of that, like think about what the internet was supposed to be and what the internet is. Right. You were going to be able to connect with everyone in the world for free. And now it's like, I'm starting to think smartphones actually made <laughs> us less connected. <Yeah. laughs>
The distinction's ownership. And, and, and that's the thing that we need to understand from this. And again, a microcosm of planned economy by somebody who is disconnected from the interests of the constituents participating in that economy. Yeah, they have no input, and that's how it works. He thinks of something, and it happens. And there's a huge lack of transparency in the organization. People don't know what's yeah, going that, on. Yeah, that's actually kind of the big, like, sensational piece of this was that. And that uncovering, like, Novo and Peter Buffett and, like, all this shady shit that's going on is part of what undercuts the functionality of a benevolent dictator controlling your economy. Novo Foundation employees have suggested that the Kingston community is not ready to have the conversation about the foundation's plans for their city. Sea Org is for the smartest and most loyal. The level five <laughs> Novo heads. How do I join Sea Org? I want to go out on the boat with L. Ron Hubbard. You stop eating Thin Mints. You stop eating Thin Mints. Exactly. No women, no gays. Yeah. <laughs> and no Thin Mints. You can't eat the Thin Mints. I know she's eating the Thin Mints. Ooh, you're not, you're not looking so good. I think, I think the master might, might notice <laughs> that you've been digging in. Was that not totally crystal goddamn clear? <laughs> <laughs> it's all based on what he wants. Yeah. And Do you want that arrangement? Do you want the regular capitalist arrangement where it's not like every single thing in town is owned by the same billionaire, but rather several of them? Like the ruling class still exists outside of Kingston, New York. The same dynamics still exist outside of Kingston, New York. They're just a little bit less obvious because they're not all one dude just being like, you know what I would like to do today? Yeah, he's and God. He is. He is becoming a lord. Yeah. And they don't want your input. They want to rule over you. They know better than you. This situation illustrates that profit can be completely taken out of the equation. And still, the capitalists get to rule over other people. In fact, they can even rule in a more singular and authoritarian manner. <laughs> like, yes, abolishing profit is good. We should care about that but it's ultimately class we have to really, truly care about. It's ownership of the means of production. That's the real key to power. That's all for today. Thanks again for watching. This is Pact. I'm Peter. This is Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor. To help us out, click like, follow, subscribe, whatever. Leave us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Audible. To support us, become a patron at patreon.com slash Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you later.